surrounding the so-called obesity epidemic in the Western world. Last night, a distinguished American uh, commentator, one Keith Olbermann, had as his guest one Anthony Bourdain, an excellent chef who hosts No Reservations, a show where he travels to locales all around the world and shows people cultures and cuisines that they might never otherwise experience. Anthony Bourdain was in, on the show to speak in favor of healthier diets becoming the norm in American life. I don't think anybody would really object, though it's interesting to note that Mr. Bourdain quickly dismissed the class dynamic of the diet debate, one that's apparent when, for example, a calorie of tomato costs two and a half times a calorie of ground beef at your local supermarket. Again, I shall return to this later. Anthony Bourdain speaks with trepidation of an America in which half of its citizenry cannot serve in the armed forces, cannot take combat roles, but perhaps only provide logistical support, working at stationary locations or building material on the home front. This is quite frankly disingenuous claptrap. We had an America, sirs, where 50% of the population was deemed biologically unable to serve in the armed forces, and yet America and the nations allied with her managed to win the Second World War. And sexism persists to this day with those legally viewed as men, though, as we have found with Christine Jorgensen and Private First Class Manning, among others, not everyone who is considered a man by the cheap fiction of cissexist law is actually a man. This is neither here nor there. The idea that both Mr. Olbermann and Mr. Bourdain seem to take umbrage at is that one class of people might force another class of people to take up more of the military burden, and that they haven't internalized that these concerns of national interest also affect them. Chicken hawks. For the last decade, there has been a steady drumbeat of rich, privileged politicos pushing for greater and more foolhardy and bloodier interventions abroad, and Mr. Olbermann, quite rightly, has been calling them out on it. Saying that we need more and more bodies on the ground, the, the fallacy is repeated by Mr. Bourdain, saying that we cannot afford an overweight nation during global war on terror. But from whence was Osama bin Laden, enemy number one in the war on terror, located? Was it embedded agents jogging about Jalalabad in a low-cardio attempt to find the evildoer? No. It was dedicated bureaucrats working in field offices examining evidence. Sedentary desk jockeys won the war on terror, and the better those desk jockeys are, the more surgical military action can be, and the less muscle, the less uh, collateral damage, the fewer body bags get loaded onto transport planes bound for homes that have lost their children too soon. Further. Mr. Olbermann announces gravely that obesity may have health care costs of $66 billion by the year 2030. Currently, the American gross domestic product is $14 trillion. That's the number you never hear mentioned in concert with large numbers like the national debt, because the former towers over the latter, and suddenly the big, big number doesn't seem so scary anymore. Keith Olbermann is desperately worried about health care spending totaling 0.467% of GDP. Meanwhile, the private health care system, which the Democrats healed with all the finesse of an overworked general practitioner at an HMO and his 27th patient of the day, ate up 16% of GDP. That's 6% of GDP, about an, American, an entire American military budget's worth of health care, more than that of Canada, or Great Britain, or France, or Germany, or Taiwan, or any other industrialized nation in the world. All with no medical bankruptcies, or deaths due to someone being unable to pay their bills, or desperate professional class people able to afford fresh vegetables, and the time, or the servants, or the restaurants to prepare that produce, instead of people become, coming home so stressed and zonked from their third job that they can't do anything but pop some convenience food into the microwave and try desperately to reconstruct some shred of their personhood. Mr. Olbermann, do you want to end the obesity epidemic? Raise the minimum wage. Employ all your muscle, all your bully pulpit pounding power with the American people to get a minimum wage bill onto the floor of the House of Representatives and dare John Boehner to kill that living wage. Pay workers enough that they can afford to take a little time off, and they will be able to take some of that time to provide for themselves decent meals. Introduce universal single-payer medicine, and use the savings to buy everyone some sushi or salad. I know it's counterintuitive, but the 
biggest indicator of obesity? Poverty. This is the result of people who have to pick what to keep or abandon, much like the continual story we hear of the senior citizen who has to decide between food and drugs or housing. Often someone is in the position of deciding between healthy food and healthy drugs, or healthy food and rent. And if every American who could afford foie gras, Mr. Olverman, Mr. Bourdain, took just a little time to realize that every American who is in danger of producing their own foie gras and their own liver is not just engaged in a moral failing, that they are merely expressing the symptoms of our own national moral failing, then perhaps we might generate the scintilla of compassion, the moment of class awareness required, instead of the prejudiced thinking that every fat person is just an unthinking red stater, as inactive intellectually as they are physically, required to set the po that if only we could find the scintilla required to set the poverty line and income support such as welfare and food stamps at a level where people are not choosing between healthy food and a decent home and a decent quality of life. And that's the way the politics of nutrition was this August 30th, 2011.